Yeah, great. Um, I'm Marcelo Bravo. I'm the CEO. Uh, I'll start doing the, the, the presentation and then Chris will take over. Chris Hill is the CFO. Um, welcome and thank you for coming. So uh, I'll just get on with it. Oxford Pharma Science, the first thing I'm going to say is um, obviously AIM listed. Uh, just to clarify, it's um, EIS and VCT qualified. It's well funded. You know, last year uh, we raised 20 million pounds. At the end of uh, December, we had uh, um, 23.1 uh, million in, in the balance sheet. So we're not really raising finance. Uh, what we're really trying to do is an effort to reach out to you. Uh, we've been a company that's been kind of like under the radar. We, we have the backing of, of some, some big institutions uh, and we talk to them regularly, but we never went out to talk you know, to, to retail investors. And, and what I'm trying to do is explain us and, and hopefully explain what the company is, what we do, you know, have a chance to, to communicate with you and give you a sense for you know, what, what is it that we do and how we're going about it so you can make up your mind. Um, so Oxford Pharma Science is a company, you know, we're a specialty pharmaceutical company, we're a development company. We don't commercialize medicines. Having said that, you know, there's an exception. We actually have a, a medicine that we commercialize, a small food supplement that's under license to um, a company in Brazil, and in fact to Bayer uh, Consumer Health. Um, but you know, what we really do is develop, um, redevelop in fact. Um, and what we're doing is applying uh, two main uh, drug delivery platforms to redevelop drugs, and this is a choice we made, you know, drugs that uh, have been around for a long time, they're approved, they're of patent, um, and where we see opportunity by you know, redevelop, applying the drug delivery platform to improve the clinical profile of that particular drug. You know, so in essence, you know, we, we, we're applying our technology you know, to drugs that exist, and, and I'll give you a sense for that in a minute. Now, why, why did we choose to do that um, it's because we see opportunity. Um, uh, we're work, one of the drugs we're working with has been around for 100 years, possibly the oldest one, and yet you can still improve it. And, in, and if you can improve it, you can create value. Um, and the route to market for these pre-approved drugs is simpler than for what's described as a new chemical entity, a new drug. A new drug uh, you know, is very risky, uh, takes you know, huge investment, um, uh, lengthy, time to bring to market. Um, we're looking for opportunities that are m more accessible um, uh, and, and quicker to market. This is our pipeline, and today we're going to talk really about this um, at the top of the pipeline. Um, and what you'll see here is four drugs that are in the same category. These are called the NSAIDs. These are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. We all know him, you know, so I mentioned aspirin. It's the oldest drug in the world. It's been of patent for 100 years. It's a wonder drug. Um, this is the second generation of the NSAIDs. And, you know, ibuprofen was invented by my, one of my previous employers, the Boots Company here in the UK. Naproxen was invented by another company trying to get around the ibuprofen patent, like Lofenac, also from the same generation. You know, you're going to hear about this story, in particular about these two assets, they're clinical stage assets, um, but you know, we basically announced that, hey, we're going out and, 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 and starting to commercialize those. We're starting to have partnering discussions around those two assets. This is earlier stage, is the application of, of a second platform to another big drug, which is atorvastatin, it's the, the, the biggest drug ever, right, it's Lipitor. Now, today I'm going to talk about the NSAIDs program, and this is um, basically the application of one of our uh, platforms, which we call OXP0, to um, the largest drug category in the world, which is the NSAIDs, you know, the non-steroidals. Um, and it's the ibuprofen, the naproxen, the aspirin that I mentioned, um, where in the past couple of years we've run um, a number of um, a small proof of concept clinical trials, and we've demonstrated that we can deliver a range of benefits on top of these NSAIDs. Um, and those benefits can deliver competitive advantage and solve problems um, in, in the marketplace. Um, a strong um, technology, so I'll talk a little bit about that, you know, but you know, we have basically intellectual property on this drug delivery system platform that we apply to these drugs. 
Now, I'll talk a little bit about the category itself. Uh, people uh, perhaps are not aware, but you know, it's actually the most prescribed, the most used drug class, you know, the, the NSAIDs, you know, the, the, the painkillers, the, the antipyretic, the anti-inflammatories, uh, $12 billion. Um, and there's a long family of NSAIDs, but four of them actually account for 80% of that market. Um, and interestingly, uh, you know, as you will learn, um, it's not just prescription markets. There's different routes to market in this particular class. Um, and as we announced earlier this year, you know, we, we've gone out uh, to the market with these two clinical stage assets. Um, and a key message is that we're actually well funded to, to do what we need to do to take these things forward. A bit about the market. Um, um, you know, ibuprofen, naproxen, diclofenac, aspirin, they account for 80% of this $12 billion market. Um, aspirin has been around for 100 years. Ibuprofen went off patent in 1984, you know, invented in 1964, uh, patented in 1964 by, by the Boots Company. Um, this picture um, is interesting not only because of the size of the market, but also because um, it's the one category that has led the, the transition to self-prescribing, to consumer um, health. So you'll see um, that uh, about 40% of the market is already self-prescribing. You know. um, people are buying their drugs in, 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 in the pharmacy uh, over the counter, and in this country, in supermarkets. You, know, you can go to the supermarket and pick up your drug. It, it seems like the obvious thing, but in many markets, even today, some of these drugs are behind the counter or even uh, prescription only. Um, this picture will change somewhat. You know, the, 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 the way the, the share and the balance of these drugs will change, but the picture will remain also the same. A hundred years from now, aspirin is still going to be there. And the same thing with ibuprofen. Possibly naproxen is going to be bigger. Possible diclofenac is going to be smaller. These drugs have become staples of, 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 of health, you know, they're, 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 you know, they're, they're, they're essential um, as population is aging, you know, anti-inflammatories, uh, and, you know, there's no new pipeline coming to replace this, you know, we're still going to have this over the counter going forward. And aspirin in particular, you know, you know, we know there's new indications. This one, by the way, is no longer used as an anti-inflammatory, um, except, except in France. Um, it's, it's an antiplatelet agent. It's used for cardiovascular benefits. You know. But the key thing here is that it's a very interesting market because there's problems that can be solved. Although they're widely used, they present problems like all drugs, and, and those problems can be solved. Um, the problem, you know, they're clinical problems, but actually the, the problem is bigger than that. You know, the key problem in this sector is lack of product differentiation. You know. um, this is a big brand, you know, in, in this country. It's the OTC, the over-the-counter expression of the original Brufen brand developed by Boots, which is still a prescription brand. Uh, and this product cannot say that it's actually different or better than this one. You know, this one sells for less right next to it and tries to look as, as close as possible. Sometimes you go and you think you're picking up the brand and you're picking up this one. You know, same thing happens in the US. They, they actually look almost the same. Um, um, I cannot say, hey, my product is better than that one. The, you read the back, if you bother to read, and it says exactly the same thing, because it's regulated. You know? So lack of differentiation is a key problem for the brand, right? I cannot say I'm better. And, if you're a cons and these are consumer goods, by the way. These are no longer prescription products. You know? This is driven by consumer purchase. I used to work for Procter & Gamble before. And the key thing uh, when you're selling consumer goods is differentiation. You know, you've got to innovate and say, hey, I'm superior, I'm better, I actually work faster, or I'm you know, more effective. Well, you cannot say that here, so that's a key problem. Um, the other problem is that you know, below this, you will have a generic, you know, at, you know, you have the Tesco tablet. Same thing, you know, ibuprofen, 200 milligrams, selling for 2p. This one sells for 23p. This one sells for like 15, you know. So there's erosion of market share, there's uh, you know, pricing pressure, you know. So it's a very competitive market where you don't have the ability to differentiate. Um, and that's the market environment. The clinical problem is GI safety. All drugs have side effects. Um, these drugs have numerous side effects. The list is long. But the main problem is GI irritation. 
You know, if you take aspirin, you know, we should all take aspirin. You know, if you're over 55, we should take an aspirin a day. But the reason why we don't take it and the reason why the regulators don't, don't, don't um, um, mandate that is because, you know, if you take an aspirin a day, very likely you'll end up with an ulcer. You know, um, it's, you know, it's very, very aggressive. Same thing with, um, with ibuprofen and so on. So GI issues, especially at high doses, especially um, if you take them over the long term, and especially if you're over 55, are actually quite real. Right? If you're taking this for a headache, if you're young, you know, it, it, you know, you're not going to get an ulcer. But if you're over 55 and you have arthritis, and you actually find yourself that, yeah, although it says here only use for a few days and then stop, and, you know, if you find yourself taking them every day, you know, you're going to run into an issue. Um, the other problem, which is uh, um, more of a market problem, has to do with the taste. These things are acids, they're very irritant. Cough and cold is a big category within pain. You know? So the NSAIDs, you'll go in, some that are for pain and for back pain, there's the kids' products and so on, and then there's the cough and cold sector. Cough and cold is actually huge, and it's very, very profitable, you know. This tablet here, you know, will be 20p. Um, the envelope here, which is a dose of, you know, another drug, but you know, is 47p in the UK. That little sachet of Lemsip. In the US, there's a product called Theraflu from GSK. Um, it's $1.50, one pound, you know, for 500 milligram of paracetamol, which actually you can buy for like 3p, right, in the supermarket. Um, why is that, you know? Cough and cold is dominated by non-tablet forms. Dry powders like this, sachets, you know, because you make your nice tea, or liquids, you know. So if you go to the US shelf, it's going to be liquids, you know, the equal and NyQuil brand from Procter & Gamble, the Theraflu from GSK, suspension syrups, and the hot, the cold hot drinks, the, the sachets. They're all paracetamol. And the reason they're paracetamol is because although ibuprofen is a better molecule, it's better at managing your symptoms and, and, and better at managing your fever. Um, if you put the dose you need here, which is 400 milligram, it burns the back of your throat. You know, I don't know if you ever shoot on a ibuprofen tablet, which you know, some of you entertain perhaps, it's gonna, you're gonna start coughing, it burns your throat. So you cannot make these products with ibuprofen or with naproxen, which are actually better molecules. So therefore the whole cough and cold sector is dominated by paracetamol, so we see also opportunity here in this market to take the NSAIDs into this very profitable segment of, of the category. The solution is OXP0 NSAIDs, our platform. You know, and as I mentioned, we've run two clinical trials um, and we demonstrated a range of benefits. You know. So we demonstrated we could reduce the GI irritation um, uh, significantly, we demonstrated significant taste masking, so we can make these products, we can make amazing products without taste, with ibuprofen, with naproxen, um, and also we can tweak and adapt the release properties. All that allows, you know, a marketeer, a brand owner, to create multiple product applications. You know, we, we have something like 200 different product applications and counting already across the two molecules. Um, very strong intellectual property. It's come initially from Oxford, uh, but also from other universities, Queensland in Australia, also some in-house. But importantly, it's not weird science. It's a different salt of the NSAID. You know, NSAIDs are acids. Um, they come to you, to your body as a salt, sodium ibuprofen or lysine ibuprofen, sodium aspirin. This is a different complex salt that achieves all these effects. Um, this is the data that was generated, this is particularly for ibuprofen. I'm not going to spend much time here. We can pick it up perhaps in, in the Q&A. But um, our data shows that this is standard ibuprofen brufen. If you take brufen for a week, you get between 60 and 70% significant gastric damage, holes, you know, erosion, and some ulcers, right? When you take our drug for a week, it drops down in half, right? It's much, much milder. Um, you can chew on the tablet and it doesn't burn. You know, that's taste masking. And then we've shown that we can play around with the release properties to, in this particular case, we think we have longer duration of effect and, and, and that type of thing. We have similar data with um, naproxen, and this is the data that, that's enabling us to go and have discussions with um, uh, potential commercial partners. Now, commercially, you know, 
this, the, the, the story that I was trying to tell you is, um, well, what does it mean in the marketplace? Well, it means, um, you know, a whole range of possible product applications. Some are very, uh, I call it, I describe them as low-hanging fruit, very, very quick to market, levering just taste masking, you know. So I could do a product like, like this that's, that puts ibuprofen or naproxen in a non-tablet form, liquid, uh, hot drink, chewable, uh, whatever. Those, those are um, 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 very tangible, very quick to market, very uh, quick wins for the platform. On the other extreme is this GI irritation, you know. So we've gone out, we've talked to um, companies, and you know, if you can deliver that GI a milder claim, it's a big differentiating um, uh, claim to be able to make in the marketplace. Um, you know, both in consumer markets, but also in prescription markets. Um, and that's what we're basically going, on, going out with, um, both with this um, ibuprofen and, and naproxen compound. What we're presenting to potential partners is, hey, here's a platform that enables a complete pipeline to help you differentiate and grow your brand for the next 10 years, which is something you cannot do now. I'm going to leave you now with um, Chris, who's going to take over the next three slides. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so Marcelo has given you the background on uh, the company, what we're trying to achieve. I'll just try to um, show you that we're a, a solid um, uh, company in a solid financial state, and uh, we use the resources we have very uh, strictly. <coughs> uh, we're a kind of pre-revenue revenue generating company. As Marcelo said, we, we sell a calcium chew food supplement. So that's where we get uh, sales from. It's kind of a, a nice to have, but we don't really pay any attention to that, to that business. It, it just runs itself. It makes a nice contribution to the top line. We've got a solid gross profit that you know, goes towards uh, what we really want to spend this on, um, which is R&D for the uh, OXP0 and the SafeStat programs. We run a very low, um, low cost operation. We're very lean and mean. Um, included in the admin expenses is basically two and a half thousand, sorry, two and a half thousand, two point five million R and D spend, um, direct R and D spend, another half million or so ancillary R and D spend, which leaves our overhead at roughly a million a year. And for a name company, that's very low. We, uh, we don't have posh uh, spankly um, head offices or anything. We operate very strictly from a low cost base. We employ uh, a very small number of staff and our business model is outsourced. So we're very adaptive to um, what we need to do. We can react very quickly and divert the resources to where we think uh, they are needed. <coughs> the, the main part of that people are interested in our financials <coughs> is the cash that's on the balance sheet. As Marcelo says, we're really well funded. We're 23.1 million on the balance sheet at the end of the year. We're not looking for fresh funds. That's um, more than enough to take us through um, any further R&D work we need to do um, with our main platforms. As I said, we're a very small team. There's myself and Marcelo as the exec directors. Uh, and then we effectively have three project managers, um, each with their own uh, lines of responsibility uh, for delivering the R&D programs. <coughs> so we've got a director of R&D that oversees uh, all of the work, clinical development manager that designs the trials, implements the trials, costs them all out, and pharmaceutical services uh, manager who effectively does all the formulation work and gets the APIs ready to go into clinic. So it's a very, um, as I've said, adaptive model. We can, we can really sort of tune in um, and direct the spend to where we need it to. And it, it means we're very agile and uh, can, can adapt to things as we need. So to wrap up um, with where we are, um, we have started a commercialization process for our lead assets, which are OXP0 ibuprofen and OXP0 naproxen. We have appointed transactional advisors. Um, they're a very blue chip investment bank um, specializing in healthcare uh, transactions. <coughs> uh, 
and they have begun an initial outreach to all of the major players, um, as we'd call them, with strategic interest in the NSAID space. Um, so you're talking all the big brand owners um, around the world, uh, key generics players that are operating just under the, the, the premium branded products, um, and any other companies we feel may be um, interested in that asset or assets. Um, what we've said so far is that we've received significant traction from those key players um, and we're, we're highly encouraged by the level of interest shown. We, we can't say that we're going to do a deal tomorrow because we don't know. It's still early stage, but we are encouraged by that level of interest being shown. Um, we've also just received in the last month or so uh, regulatory feedback from the MHRA, which has clarified our path forward. So when we're speaking to these interested parties, we can give them a, a very clear steer on what needs to be done to get a product to market with the claims that they want. Um, so we're trying to partner these assets pre-phase three, so pre-registration, <coughs> pardon me, um, which basically means we're trying to allow any potential partner to come in early um, and tailor any phase three trials to their, to their desires, really. Um, so they'll get some inputs into how the phase three trial designs look, what claims will eventually go on the packets, etc. cetera. Um, while we're doing this, we're still pushing our pipeline forward. We're focusing on trying to get aspirin through the development stage um, to catch up with ibuprofen and naproxen. Um, because we really see the aspirin um, as, a, as a key market for us. It, it could be um, you know, easily the size of ibuprofen or naproxen for us. So that's a, that's a focus, and we've now just brought the statins work forward. Um, so we're, we're now progressing with that molecule as well. Uh, and the takeaway is we're, we're, in, we're in these commercial discussions. Um, We've got a strong balance sheet so that we're not going to be pushed around by any of these big boys who may sort of want to uh, negotiate with us when we've only got a few million left in the bank to sort of try and get the asset on the cheap. That's not going to happen. Um, and we're very well positioned to uh, do the work that's required to get these all the way through to registration if we think that's the best thing to do. But w what we're doing is uh, trying to get the best deal for uh, our shareholders. Else to say? I, I, th I think I said we're in Q and A time now. <laughs> Any questions, with anybody? Gentleman at the front. Hi, I've got a few questions. Um, yes. Number one, what will be the relative price of your reformulated ibuprofen compared with the generics that are on the market at the moment? Price on the shelf? Um, no, price to the pharmacist or the NHS. Yeah, I, I, I cannot give you a strong steer on that, but price on the shelf for a consumer health product, OTC product, is going to be similar to what you see now in the premium end. Yeah. Uh, the second thing, your graph of the side effects of ibuprofen compared with your product, what dose were you using? That was our X dose, prescription dose, of 400 milligram three, um, three times, three times six, no, sorry, 800 milligram three times a day. 800 so, milligrams. Yeah, yeah. So, that's why you got so much gastric erosion, because normally the dose here is 400 milligrams three times a day. Yeah, so that's over the counter. Thousand. That's yeah. over the counter. Yeah. Okay. yeah. This was after one week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. that was a high dose. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, then, uh, Merck, Sharp, and Dome tried to switch uh, Simvastatin to be an over the counter mm. product, but it was an absolute failure because the great British public wouldn't spend £10 a month on a product, but they could see no benefits. They'll buy a headache product, but they're not going to go into the chemist and keep buying something for £10. They can't see any benefits, especially when they can go to the doctor and get a prescription mm -hmm. for £8.40 for a three-month supply. Also, Dick Fennec over the counter has been... So you're talking about, are you talking about statins or NSAIDs? Sorry. Yeah. Are, uh, what was Statin, the point? Uh, no, the point is... I don't see a market in the UK, I don't know about the broad, for but an over the counter in statin. A statin. Because yeah. the public won't, won't carry on paying for it because of our NHS um, system. I, 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 there are reasons why that failed, and it has, there are a lot of reasons, and it wasn't just 
that, it was also you know, the time and the way it was executed. They had no support <coughs> from GPs. Or, anyway, I'm not talking about OTC okay. statins necessarily. So, so the next, next question, um, diclofenac has actually been withdrawn in the UK over the yeah. Delta. And the proxen is limited to a pack of nine tablets, yeah. mainly for period yeah. pains. So the reason why we're not really focusing on diclofenac, we, we've, done, we've done it, you know, we have the compound but we decided not to take it to the clinic is exactly that. I, I think the clofenac prescriptions are coming down and, and yeah, it's been taken out of the OTC markets um, because of its heart risk. And actually that's favoring naproxen. So naproxen is the drug that clinicians want to prescribe because it presumably has a better heart profile, but it's actually quite aggressive in the EI track, yeah. I think it all depends on what the, the price is relative to the generic as to whether the NHS yeah. will pay for it. It's got to have significant yeah. advantages. Yeah. And last but not least, the aspirin. Mm -hmm. What strength are you considering doing that at? 75 milligram or 300? Or both? Uh, it, 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 it's, it's too early to answer that. You know, I mean, if you're going the prescription route initially, um, where long-term use is, is approved for, you know, in, 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 uh, um, under certain regimes, you will be doing, yeah, 325 or whatever. But it's the, the 75 that's going on prescriptions. 75 or 81, right? Depending on where you Don't are. Don't get any prescriptions for 300. Yeah. Thank you. More questions? Gentleman, second back row. Um, what improvements are you seeking for aspirin? Excuse me? What improvements? Reduction in GI irritation. Yeah, aspirin is all about reduction in, in, in GI, gastric mucosal damage, irritation, risk. You know, if, if, you, if you read the back of the pack in North America, it will say severe gastric bleed warning. Um, so it's really about reducing the risk of severe gastric bleed warning, you know, basically. What we measure is, is an endoscopic trial. We measure erosions and ulcers. And it's just reduction in numbers of that. You know. yeah. Can I ask, what, what stage are you are in the trial? Are you exempt from phase one because obviously existing um, formulation or have you got to go through phase one, two, and three? Yeah, so it depends on what you're doing. So um, I talked about ibuprofen, right? So um, if I want to roll out um, a product like this, which is really not about GI, it's about taste mask sachets of ibuprofen, you need some PK data. That's, that's what you need. This is a, a absorption, you know, the, the way that the drugs absorb in the body and metabolize, just showing, you know, showing that you're similar comparable to, to whatever reference in whatever market you're going. That, that's all you need. If you're going for the GI claim, you need to do a phase three trial. Uh, in the UK, the MHRA agreed to a protocol. You know, we went to them some time ago, did a consultation, and they agreed to a protocol, an eight week trial, where you measure what we measure in these trials, you know, number of erosions and number of ulcers. <coughs> so that, that would be your phase three, you know, pivotal trial, basically. <laughs> Could you just do the taste um, masking separately from all the others, so you could? Yeah, yeah. So for, it's, it's one of the, the decisions we need to make. So, for example, um, we know in the UK, you know, our product is one of the products is by equivalent to the reference. Is that a strategic choice for us just to get a dossier and either f take it forward beyond dossier ourselves, or you know, uh, um, commercialize the, the dossier because it's actually quite quite you know, low effort to, to go and get that product approved. You know, that's an option. For the GI uh, work, you know, uh, whoever wants to take that forward needs to run a, um, a trial and, and, and under the, 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 the guidance of this last MHRA uh, interaction. You know. But in the retail space, people like Neurofen, their differentiation has to change because they are just a marketing um, company, really, aren't they? So if they had a reformulated Neurofen, yeah. They could probably up their sales just on a taste change, couldn't they? Let alone the yeah, there's different benefits. ways in which you can apply the, the platform to do different things. Yeah. 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 So taste taste is very important in consumer health. Um, you know, formulation options and, and so on, particularly in cough and cold, as we've seen. Um, in children's medicines, it's all about taste and forms. Um, in in adult pain and, and long term pain management, you know, uh, safety becomes more relevant. Yeah. Any other questions, anybody? Gentleman just there. Thank you very much. It's a very interesting presentation. Yeah. And, and I think very interesting concept, the idea yeah. of making the drug 
easier to take and safer. I guess a couple of questions I had are some similar. First question was about the safety. Is it actually a safer product, or is it just a product which doesn't cause irritation? Because that, if it's a safe product, then it's a yeah. huge market. If it's no, a the, the, uh, so we've had the discussion with MHRA, so the, the claim is it reduces gastric mucosal damage. Yes, yeah, so, so it doesn't so reduce safe. bleeding then? Huh? It doesn't reduce bleeding. We're, well, we act, no, exactly. We avoid it. You know, bleeding is a tough endpoint. You know, yeah, it's a yeah, tough because no, no, you, you know, you know, bleeding is a spontaneous and it may happen after two years or randomly. So you don't want it bleeding as your endpoint. You don't want ulcers at your endpoint either, because you know, then you have to go for six months. Or so. so we had a conversation with MHRA where they've agreed. Look, it's eight weeks. You know, and if you can get that, you know, erosion and ulcers, endoscopic erosions and ulcers, you know, measurement. And if you can show a difference there, we're happy with that as this, uh, you know, GI safer product, you know, that reduces gastric mucosal damage as measured by endoscopy. Yeah, I guess as a technical thing, yeah. if that product is safer, so mm -hmm. essentially NSAIDs, mm -hmm. the problem with NSAIDs is the three drugs that you don't give yeah. to older people, yeah. NSAIDs is one of them. Yeah. And it's because of bleeding. Yeah. So if your product is an acid which causes yeah. less bleeding, then that, that market is completely different from it being one which is less irritation. That's the thing I was asking, I guess. Yeah, yeah, but I, frankly, we we don't want to go to a bleeding bleeding as an endpoint. So the product can't stop bleeding. Is that what you think? It no, can't no, the no, it's not that. It's it's an impossible endpoint to go and prove clinically or very expensive. I, mean, I guess. I guess so. Yeah, yeah it's, but all you need to show, I mean, very technically, you just yeah. need to show the platelet function yeah, is decreasing yeah, in a different way yeah. than then. So anyway, I mean, we, we've had. Not. I mean, we we've done work with clinicians and with payers, right, to discuss this endpoint, and and we have evidence of clinician adoption. And we have evidence of payer, this is in North America, you know, insurance company, a willingness to pay, you know, to a, to a certain level uh, yeah, that, yeah. that provides I for a very... I think the market is yeah. bigger, depending yeah. on. The other question was, I think... This again, last question, by the way, sorry, can we, we're oh, sorry, on sorry. Sorry. No, you have that, do that yeah. one, but that'll be the last one. The product you're comparing against Brufin, when actually, you're, actually your brand, your marketing mm. is against paracetamol, really. No, oh, that, that, was, that was in the context of, of taste masking of Yeah, I know, of, but for taste powders. masking, if yeah. I'm going to the shelf as a yeah. consumer, yeah. I'm going to, to be quite honest with you, yeah. and I'm a doctor, I yeah. would still pick up yeah. the lens if yeah. I wouldn't yeah. look at the packet. Most people yeah. don't pick up yeah. the packet looking yeah. at it. Yeah. So actually, how is it compared to the paracetamol in terms of tastes? Uh, we, we've developed some great products, some fantastic products. No, but yeah. is it, so is it worse tasting than the Lemsip? Because if it isn't, then it's a competing product. No, it's, it's not, it's, it's different to the Lemsip, um, and it's different flavors as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and they're really, really nice, actually. Okay, yeah, and I, I yeah. guess my question was, if yeah, you can, yeah. that's where your competition essentially is, isn't yeah. it, rather than the proof? That yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think we have to separate marketing consumer type comparisons, and then what you need to go and get a product approved, and a claim approved, and this and that. I mean, if I wanted to roll my product out, yeah, I need PK data against the reference. Who knows what the reference is? And they're, they're different in different countries, right? Yeah. And you would be surprised, but you know, sometimes the reference is not around anymore, and so on. But, you know, and, and that's the data you get because that's what the regulator needs to see. But then in market, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a taste preference against whatever's on the shelf, you know, yeah. which is very different. Yeah. No, okay, thank you. It was very good. Thank, yeah. thank you very much, yeah. you both of you. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation. Right. Thank you.